first, I'd like to thank Professor Alonso for joining us today. I'm very grateful he'll present to us. And Professor Alonso is a professor in ETH Zurich in the Computer Science Department. He's a member of the Systems Group and the head of the Institute for Computing Platforms. Um, research interests encompass almost all aspects of systems uh, from design to runtime. Uh, he works on distributed systems, data processing, and aspects of uh, system aspects of programming languages. Most of his current research is related to data processing on data centers, so very, very relevant to the things we're talking about this week, and also to the cloud, as well as hardware acceleration using FPGAs. Professor Alonso has received numerous awards for his work, including four test of time awards for contributions to databases, programming languages, mobile computing, and systems. So I'll pass over to you, Professor Alonso, and uh, I'll let you introduce your talk. All right, great. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for the for the kind introduction. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to be here, and it's uh, it's my great pleasure to have the chance to uh, talk to all of you. So what I want to do is uh, uh, I want to sort of take a little bit of uh, if you want to step back whenever we talk about FPGAs on the cloud and data centers. Uh, I know that you are attending this winter school, which is uh, you're learning a lot of very interesting things about how to deal with. Uh, the new boards and bytes and, and the new programming environment and all the all the different devices and all the opportunities that it offers. So I, I thought that uh, it would be good to try to give you a perspective that uh, is based on actually our work with FPGAs. And uh, of course, like everybody else, we, we need to fight and, uh, and struggle to get the design working and running and meeting, the, meeting timing and the specifications and that it has the proper performance. But I want to, I don't want to sort of put too much emphasis on that, although we can discuss it if you want to. I want to sort of take advantage of a little bit of our background uh, coming more from the software side of things to talk about what it means to have FPGAs on, on the cloud and data centers, not only from our experience, but also from what we're seeing uh, in, in practice and what is happening in industry, right? Uh, and please, uh, I, you know, as Kahal has said, I'm a professor, I'm used to teaching, uh, but teaching gets very boring if it is a monologue. So don't be afraid to interrupt me, discuss with me, ask questions uh, at any time. Uh, just either uh, raise your hand in, uh, in Zoom if you want to, or just turn on your microphone and interrupt me, and then we can actually uh, go, go to questions and so on, okay? So uh, the overview for the talk is uh, I'm going to sort of uh, first talk about FPGAs in data centers, try to sort of uh, data centers and the cloud and try to put a little bit of uh, what I'm going to say in perspective. Then I'm going to talk about uh, two use cases. These are based on work that we have done. And these two use cases is something uh, are something that I consider to be very relevant because this is not just something that we have sort of made up in academia, but this is something that we have done together with a company, Amadeus. And in fact, in both cases, this is actually going into production at a certain point or another. Uh, but I will actually take advantage of the experience that we are gaining by trying to put these things into production to actually discuss exactly what is the title of this talk, what it means to put uh, FPGAs in data centers and the cloud, and what are the implications uh, of doing so. And then I will conclude a little bit about networking for FPGAs, because that's a little bit the conclusion of the presentation that I'm going to, uh, or the main ideas that I'm going to be presenting. So, <clears throat> Let's start uh, with, with the following question. What is different about an FPGA in the data center? In a data center, by now, you have uh, CPUs, uh, you have different types of CPUs, you have GPUs, you have TPUs, right, uh, which are the, the tensor processing units that Google has. So uh, you have a smart NICs. Uh, there, there is a slew of, of hardware floating around, and it's becoming increasingly more complicated. The question is that uh, what are FPGAs or why are SP FPGAs special in a data center? And they are special in a very specific way. Uh, and I want to, this is something that even a lot of people doing research on FPGAs do not quite realize. So this is why I want to put emphasis on it. And in order to actually demonstrate that in fact, this is what makes them special, I want to take the work that Microsoft has done on the Catapult deployment uh, on, in the Azure cloud, where they actually have deployed now FPGAs at very large scales. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's probably the largest deployment of FPGAs that anybody has ever done until now. Now, what is important, important about that is that um, this was not a one-shot thing. No, it is not that somebody came up with a design, put it in there, deployed, and they got going. This is not how it works. 
uh, especially not in the case of FPGAs. So what you see on the slide is Microsoft Catapult version one. This was described on a paper that was published in 2014. Uh, this is uh, it's an FPGA that is connected uh, to, uh, to the host uh, to just a normal uh, PCI uh, interconnect. And the FPGAs, because this is a data center, the FPGAs are connected to each other, not, not to other computers. They are connected to each other using the serial interfaces of the FPGA. So in essence, uh, what they did is that uh, if they wanted to have more than one FPGA, is uh, they will actually use this uh, serial interconnect to talk to another interconnect, to talk to another FPGA. And just to have something that is more than just one, two, or three, or four FPGAs together, they build what you see on the figure. Uh, they build um, <coughs> this, uh, let me just try to sort of get this. Uh, they, they build this Torus type of network where uh, they actually uh, connect the FPGAs in a particular way, building a particular special topology so that you could actually come up with uh, interesting things that you could do with the FPGAs. And the type of application that they had at the time, they were accelerating uh, processing of documents uh, for search and so forth. What they had is that they had a collection of seven hosts, each one with its own CPU, a CPU and of course uh, an FPGA. And they will take advantage of this Torus network to actually have the FPGAs connected in a, in a sort of like a circular pipeline where data will start from, the, from here and then it will go around uh, this pipeline with different stages of the processing of the documents that had it. Okay, so that was version one. And if you look at the literature, uh, if you have had already look at the literature, you are familiar with what people have been trying to do with FPGAs whenever they try to use more than one over the last many years. This is a very common way of doing it, probably at a bit of a larger scale than what people have tried to do, but this connection to the serial interface and so forth, right? I mean, uh, seems to make sense. Now. Microsoft, which has been very, very open and for researchers in academia has been fantastic, right? They have been so open about it and they have written about it, right? And they came up with this uh, and then very quickly realized they said, this is not going to work. This is just not going to work on a data center. And it's not going to work not for reasons of performance. It's not going to work not for any particular reason about the FPGA or, or, or anything like this. It's because of the very nature of a data center. So building this Torus network is complicated. Um, Microsoft deploys thousands, hundreds of thousands of these computers, right, on a regular basis. This requires almost manual cabling. You need to sort of connect these, these FPGAs in a very particular way. If you make errors, then you end up with a different topology and then you run into problems. So that this actually very, very quickly became clear that useful as it was, because they actually proved that they could actually accelerate Bing, the search engine of Microsoft, right, in significant ways by using this system they realized that for practical purposes, this was not the way to deploy an FPGA on, uh, on, on, uh, on the cloud. So they came up with um, version two of Catapult. Uh, version two was described on a paper that appeared two years later. And version two starts looking something more like something that, that we are familiar with, right? So the FPGA, and this is what you see, oops, sorry. I, uh, Okay, uh, so the, they started, uh, what they did is they actually took a computer and then the computer had a NIC network uh, interface card and then they put an FPGA and then all the traffic that was going from the computer to the outside went through the FPGA and then to the outside world. So they, what they did is they took the FPGA, they put it on the network path, bumping the wire type of design, as it is called, and the FPGA was connected to the outside world uh, through the network. Okay, so that was version two. Uh, and then two years later, they came up with yet another version. And it was version three. Uh, and uh, in version three, which is somewhat similar, uh, but internally, in terms of hardware, right? I mean, I actually was doing things that uh, in, a, in a rather different way because inst in, in, instead of having a NIC that is separated from the FPGA, what they did, and then you see it on the figure here in the middle, uh, what they did is that uh, they actually, the NIC is now attached to the, uh, to the FPGA. 
uh, the, the way they actually don't have, they have less cables connecting the host to the FPGA and the NIC to the, to the FPGA and so forth. So they actually this reduces cost. And also what they did, I mean, I, I was just attending the last 10, 15 minutes of the previous presentation about how FPGA companies, whenever they find uh, designs or modules that everybody uses and where the interface and the, the becomes a little bit a standard, then these, these, these things are hardened. So what Microsoft did is actually said, well, we do not really need to have an IP running part of the network protocol because for these, there are ASICs that actually do this very well. And this is why they have uh, this NIC ASIC attached to the FPGA so that the NIC ASIC actually deals with most of the protocol and the FPGA is actually used for running the smarts. Okay? So this is what Microsoft calls a smart NIC. Uh, but in essence, this is the way they have FPGAs deployed um, uh, in the cloud. Okay. Now, this is why, why, is in, why am I presenting this evolution, right? And again, these are papers that appear with a two year difference uh, 2014, 2016, 2018. Uh, it is important because it actually shows that the way we integrate FPGAs in these systems is still not fixed. People are still trying. And that is the big advantage of FPGAs. FPGAs architecturally can be used in many different ways. And people, in fact, are using them in many different ways. And this is what is different from standard processors. If you want to use a CPU, you need to have a motherboard, and then you have to use the standard computer, and that's where your CPUs are. If you want to use a GPU, you take a GPU, you plug it on the PCA bus, you need to have a host, and this is how you use a GPU. Right? A TPU has somewhat similar constraints. You take a TPU, you plug it on the host, and then you off you go and you use it. An FPGA is different. Of course, there is a version of the FPGA, like what you find in the Amazon F1, or what we have on the, on the Silence clusters, right? I mean, uh, that we are uh, running here at ATH. You have an FPGA that is on the PCA bus. But that is one of many possible configurations where you can actually have an FPGA on the cloud and on a data center. And what the Microsoft design shows is that how they have gone from uh, an FPGA as a coprocessor, where in order to gain a little bit more processing capacity, they connect the FPGAs to each other. Uh, and now the FPGA is a first class citizen. It is on the network. They can actually talk to, uh, let me just go back to the previous slide. Uh, uh, the FPGA can talk to the top of the rack switch. Uh, and then that way the FPGA can actually connect with any other FPGA in the data center. That's a very different architecture from the traditional one where the FPGA is a coprocessor hiding behind the, the CPU, and then you need to have a lot of software, you need to have a lot of things in, in between, right, in order to actually make the, the, the FPGA accessible. Okay. So, so this is important. When we are talking about FPGAs on the cloud and on data centers, uh, one, possible uh, one possible deployment is the one in which the FPGA is on the PCI bus, a coprocessor, but that is not necessarily the only one, and it's not necessarily the most useful one. And I'll come back to that uh, uh, in a moment. Now, let me actually give you just to sort of make sure that nobody accuses me of uh, talking only about one company and not another and so forth. That's not the only, the only deployment that you see out there, right? Uh, so Amazon, which offers the F1 instances where the, the FPGA is available on the PCI bus, has also started offering what is called Amazon's Aqua. Now, Amazon's Aqua is a very specific system, so I'm not going to spend too much time describing it. But uh, what it does, this is a caching layer that is sitting between your compute nodes and the Amazon S3 uh, storage. And uh, what happens is that if you're running a lot of processing data, reading data from, uh, from S3 tends to be cumbersome. So what uh, um, an S3 typically is relatively cheap storage. So what this caching layer does, it puts the data on an intermediate layer that is based on SSDs, so they are faster. And now comes the interesting thing. There is something that is called uh, AWS, Design Analytics Processor. This is actually an FPGA. It's an FPGA that is doing query processing. And what this does is that it allows you to actually implement data caching in nodes that do not really have a processor per se, what they have is a network interface. They use uh, Amazon's uh, Nitro, that is their own uh, SmartNIC. And then they have an FPGA and an FPGA that has an SSD attached to it. And they can actually offload data processing computations, typically queries, filtering, aggregation, and so forth. They can actually offload it uh, to these nodes, right? 
So that's another very useful uh, example of how you can actually use an FPGA. And with this, I just want to sort of, I have given two examples. I want to emphasize that whenever you think about FPGAs on a data center or on the cloud, don't think of our FPGAs just as a coprocessor because they're actually being used in many different ways. Now, what is common between these two um, designs, the last one of Microsoft and Amazon Sakwa, is the fact that these things are available through the network, right? Uh, and, um, and this is in contrast to what was the first design that Microsoft chose for Catapult or the design that you actually find in many research papers, right? So now to make a little bit of a connection and now talk, I'm going to start talking about uh, our, our own work, our own research, right? I mean, uh, on the, on the Silinx uh, cluster, and we have our ETH, one of the things that uh, in my group we have been doing is try to sort of put a lot of emphasis on the network, right? I mean, uh, so these are great boards uh, that are very, very powerful. Uh, each one of them has uh, network connections, has two network connections, 100G and so forth. Uh, and Silence has um, released an uh, an, you know, UPD, UDP stack, right? Uh, excuse me for the typo, right? Uh, <laughs> that, um, that actually allows to connect these, these, these boards, right? Uh, uh, we have developed in my group, right? I mean, with a bunch of other people at TCPIP stack that actually will be presented as far as I understand in the, in the school, right? That, that allows you to actually just have normal communication between these boards. We also have an RDMA stack that we have not yet quite ported to these boards, but it's actually working, right? And so forth. And um, the interesting thing is that once you have networking and the FPGAs are connected to the network, they are no longer just a coprocessor. They become computing nodes. And once the FPGA becomes a computing node, things change in fundamental ways whenever you're actually trying to consider them as part of your computing infrastructure in a data center. And this is what I'm gonna try to sort of show to you, uh, give you a bit of a, a, an idea of why this is the case with two concrete, concrete use cases uh, from uh, our own work, okay? So now, um, when um, when we started uh, thinking about um, the FPGAs uh, in the cloud and, and things like this, they, um, we started working with a company called Amadeus. Amadeus is an airline uh, reservation provider, airline uh, pro IT provider. And among the many other things that they do is that they actually uh, run the search engines uh, for the different airlines, but also for the websites where you will go and try to book your flights. Okay? Now, uh, this used to be a great example. Now in the times of the virus, talking about flights and booking flights and, and going on vacation is not a good example because obviously nobody's going anywhere. But eventually, you know, let's hope that we get out of this and then people will start traveling. So, uh, behind this ability to look for flights and so forth, there is a search engine. Uh, and the search engines are actually uh, rather complicated. We, we typically uh, have, even people who are familiar with IT, uh, people have a rather naive version of how these systems work. Uh, these are very, very complicated, complicated systems. Uh, in fact, the, the search engines that Amadeus uses are entire data centers, many hundreds, many thousands of computers. Uh, with many, many, with a lot of different functionality, uh, with many, many specialized components. Of course, everything has to be redundant for fault tolerance, and it is highly tuned, right? Uh, so performance matters a lot because these are interactive systems where typically you have just a couple of seconds to actually answer a requery, and there is also a high throughput on these systems. There are a lot of people looking for flights, and then you need to maintain. Uh, the latency and so forth. So SLAs are very important, service level agreements. You, you, you cannot afford to take too long to do anything because otherwise you're gonna miss the deadlines. And in the case of Amadeus being a provider for this, actually they, they lose money. If, if a certain amount of requests take longer than a particular specification, they, they need to start paying money to the users uh, of, of these systems, okay? Now, uh, this is not a common problem. Uh, this is actually a lot of the websites that are running social networks, uh, web shopping, electronic commerce, uh, search engines, and so forth, actually suffer from this problem. And what is interesting is that they are solving the problem by brute force. Uh, in essence, they just throw more computing nodes to the problem. So if you need to have 500 computing nodes, then you put them in there. And if you need to increase the capacity of the system, then you put another 500 computing nodes, right? Uh, so this is how you end up with these very large data centers that are doing all of them. 
Now, in the case of uh, Amadeus, we work on uh, with them together on something that is called um, the, 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 the master price flow. Uh, and this has a different type of components. And I'm gonna give you a very, very, and very quickly, just a very simplified version of how this works. So imagine that you want to find a flight from uh, Zurich to Seattle. So this is the query that you give. Then your query goes into something that is called the domain explorer that runs on a normal computer. The domain explorer, what it does, it just goes and starts gathering information on what are the potential flights that you could actually take to go from Zurich to Seattle. Okay. Um, and then what it does, it actually takes about 750 possible combinations of these flights and then gives it to another system that runs into another computer. But what it runs is what is called the route selection. And route selection, what it does, it tries to sort of figure out which are of these possible uh, options that you have to go from Zurich to Seattle, what are the best possible ones? And then out of these 750 that come from the Domain Explorer, then you have 150 that go to the pricing engine and the pricing engine then computes the price for your flight. And then there are 150 price solutions that is given uh, as an answer to your query. Uh, when, when I, in the figure, when, when it says CPU, it means that each one of those boxes is run on a normal computer, running on CPUs, but it doesn't mean that it runs on a single one. Each one of those components, the Domain Explorer will be several hundred computers. The route selection is also a few hundred. The pricing engine is actually a very complicated structure also with several hundred computers. So this is a very complex system. Now, of course, um, this is a company that is trying to run search engines uh, and, and is trying to sort of make the most out of the search, like everybody who runs a search engine. So one of the things that they do is they try to sort of uh, make sure that they, the routes that they select, the options that they give to the users are the best possible ones. Because those are the ones that eventual users are gonna buy. And this is what is important for them. So what they did is they actually included a module at a certain point based on machine learning, like everybody else today, where uh, what they did is that they took these 750 routes that came from the Domain Explorer and they ran through another set of computers, a few hundred of them, that actually score those routes. Uh, and and the, the, the routes were scoring, um, and you will see it in a second how, they were, how it was done, right? Uh, based on uh, decision trees running on the CPU, uh, where uh, it will assign a particular score to every route. And then this will go to the route selection that using a number of heuristics and other decisions will choose the best ones. So for them, this was a huge improvement because adding this machine learning module based on decision trees uh, resulted in them making a much better selection of the routes that went eventually to the user. And actually they significantly increase what they call the findability, which at the end translates into, uh, I'm showing a bunch of results to the user. Is the user going to be interested enough in each one of them or in one of them to actually buy them or not, right? Uh, so adding this module, significantly improve the system because actually of the results provided, people were actually clicking on more, many more of them and eventually buying the ticket. Right. So uh, what happens is that the, if you look at the route scoring, and that's the problem, the first problem that I'm gonna be briefly talk about, right? I mean, uh, these are several hundred multi-core servers. Uh, they, they has, as I said, very tight latency limitations. It's four seconds, right, uh, uh, for the whole search. Uh, the route scoring, the, the, the limitations that it had is actually much smaller, right? That's, uh, it's in the, the few hundred uh, milliseconds, right? Uh, and so forth. So, uh, yes? Professor Alan, so I have a question here. Yes. Uh, like when you said that, uh, like this whole system was able to give like better solutions, right? Uh, but like in most of the machine learning or AI related application, there's obviously some kind of, uh, you know, error suppression. Like it's more, it's mostly a quality of service thing. So like on an average, how better was the quality of solutions provided? I, I don't, I don't have the number on the top of my mind. We have this on the paper uh, because okay. we wrote a paper about this together with Amadeus. Uh, they, they, the, the number that I have in mind, but I'm not hundred percent sure is that they were able to improve what they call the findability by 10%, oh, uh, okay. which means that they got 10% more hits if you want to, right? Yeah, okay. okay. And this is this is a huge improvement, right? Uh, and, and again, the, the reason why this is done because people do not add several hundred machines. This is very expensive. It's a system that costs several million, right? Unless they significantly improve what they're doing, right? 
and and did they and did this solution also improve on the run time like on the execution time no 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 this 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 is uh this is the standard problem in computer science if you have a if you have a problem you are another layer of indirection or you are another level in the system and this is what they did which actually creates its own set of problems because now you have one more step that you need to do but you cannot significantly increase the time that it takes to answer these things right so actually okay. then the latency constraints become very tight right okay. so okay. it did not improve performance it actually makes the system more complex because there are more steps that you need to run in order to get an answer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, so then let me just sort of give you a rough idea of what we did about the route scoring. Uh, and I want to go a little bit fast because uh, we, we do have a paper with a lot of details on how actually we have several papers on, on, on how this is done, right? On different configurations, on different systems and so forth. You can go and look at them, uh, but I want to sort of the point that I want to bring is how do you actually deploy this on the cloud and, and what are the consequences of doing this, right? So uh, when, when we started working on Amadeus on this problem, right, I mean, uh, the problem statement was we need to improve the quality of the results. Uh, how do we improve the quality of the results is by right, running this, this route scoring module, right? I mean, uh, and this has to be done without increasing the latency, okay? So um, the budget that we have for the route scoring is 10 milliseconds. Uh, so, so this is your question was, do, do we improve performance? No, we, we had 10 milliseconds. So whatever it is that we do had to be done in under 10 milliseconds. The current system or the system before we started is based uh, or was based on decision trees and is run on decision trees on a system called H2O. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, think about it as like a form of TensorFlow that actually runs decision trees. And um, that was our baseline. So what we did, and again, I wanted to explain this very quickly, right? We took this decision trees. What is a decision tree? Uh, is just a uh, data structure where you have a tree, every node in the tree is a decision point. And the way you actually classify something or you get something a ranking is that you traverse the tree from the, from the top to the bottom and then traversing your decision points until you get to the leaves that either classify what you see or your input or give you a ranking for that input. Now a decision tree, if you use only one tree, uh, it has a bunch of problems that have to do with machine learning, right? Tends to do, do a lot of overfitting and the trees tend to be a little bit too uh, unwieldy. So what people use are decision tree ensembles, which is a collections of many hundreds of trees uh, that are created in a particular way. Uh, and then whenever you need to sort of classify something, you run it through all these trees and then you aggregate the results of all these trees to get your classification. So what we did uh, in a nutshell is that we took uh, uh, this, this uh, tree ensemble and then we deployed on an FPGA. Uh, and uh, what we did is that uh, we took advantage of what an FPGA provides, which is a lot of spatial parallelism. And then what we, what we were able to do is we had uh, 28 processing engines in there uh, every processing engine had uh, the ability to process uh, a number of trees. And then we could actually have uh, several of these things uh, deployed on an FPGA. Um, the, we, were able, we were able to process more than 800 trees at the same time on the FPGA. So that means that whenever we get uh, one of those routes for flying, that we need to score we can actually run it in parallel over these 800 trees and then find the average. And then if you want to in a single logical step, not, not a single clock cycle, but in a single logical step, we run it through uh, the whole uh, tree ensemble. So this of course is, is very, very fast. And uh, what we, we were hoping is that by implementing and taking advantage of the uh, parallelism that the FPGA gives you, we'll get something that is significantly better than what is available today. And in fact, yes, when we did the experiments, uh, then uh, we got, um, uh, we, we were surprised actually that it was, uh, but it was this good, right? Uh, let me just sort of focus if you want to on the, uh, on, the uh, on the, on the graph here, right? I mean, uh, so, so this is uh, what we were doing in terms of the million routes per second that we could actually run through uh, to the trees. Um, 
uh, and this is the actual rollable thing, the two engines overall. This is if we put two engines on the FPGA and counting the cost of moving the data, getting the responses out and everything else, right? I mean, uh, so we can do close to, to 50 million routes per second, right? Uh, so this is significantly, significantly more than you can do with, uh, with uh, CP. Uh, we actually, we run this on Amazon because Amadeus was interested in running this on the cloud, right? So we deployed this on the Amazon F1. And then here you see the results, right? This is the number of routes per dollar, right? I mean, uh, these are the ones that you can do with a GPU, different type of GPUs with a CPU, and what we can do with a single instance of an FPGA. You can see that for the same price, we can actually get significant improvement in performance. So, so this is great. Um, so, and the question is that, well, you have proven that this is cheaper and it has higher performance, uh, then you are done, right? Well, uh, this is actually not true, right? I mean, uh, so in essence, uh, what happens is that uh, whenever we, uh, we, we actually have this result, then you need to decide what are you going to do with it, right? So uh, what happens is that now that we have this component, the route selection running on FPGA, the question is, where do we put it, right? And one of the interesting things is actually move it away from the route selection and then put it together with the domain explorer. Why? If you recall, I told you at the beginning that uh, the route scoring was taking 750 routes uh, because the route selection, this is what it actually took as input. But now we have something that can process many, many more routes per second. So why actually limit it to 750? We could actually go and move it to the domain explorer and then actually give it many million routes so that we will actually get them a score. And then we will actually have an even bigger or even better impact by having this, uh, this module, considering a much larger number of inputs uh, in order to do the ranking, okay? So, uh, so this is something that uh, if you think about it, right? I mean, uh, this is a question of how are you going to deploy this? It is not just a question of saying, well, I have something that is faster than an FPGA, let's just go and replace whatever is it that's running on the CPU with an FPGA and we are done. In this particular case, it actually had implications because you are actually will be changing the system for, for much better, right? If you will do it in this particular way, we could actually have a much bigger impact in doing this. Now, uh, if you are not familiar with real deployments, uh, you might actually be surprised that the reason why people are interested in things, in these things, is not necessarily or strictly not performance, but it's also cost, especially in data centers and the cloud. So this actually matters to Amadeus because uh, the, the, it could actually significantly reduce the cost of running the system. So imagine that you had, and this is a very simple calculation, but this is something that we have done together with them, and we do have the real numbers, but I cannot publish them because they are confidential. So imagine that you were using a number of machines for route scoring, right? I mean, uh, whatever X number is, imagine several hundred, right? Uh, so now that we can actually do the route scoring with FPGAs um, and the FPGAs are much better in terms of throughput, then you hope that you're going to need much less machines. So instead of reading, reading, needing X machines, you're going to need Y machines with an FPGA for route scoring and you hope that Y is much smaller than X. If that is the case, of course, now your data center is going to be cheaper because instead of having to buy X machines for, for the route scoring, you're going, to buy, find, uh, you're going to buy Y. And if Y is significantly smaller than X, in spite of the fact that they have an FPGA, which makes the machine more expensive, you're still going to be ahead because you need far less machines. Right? So this is actually what is interesting for somebody running a data center. Um, now, and this is true only, uh, this is true as well if you have uh, running on a data center, but it's also true if you're running on the cloud. And this is especially on the cloud, this becomes very interesting because it actually allows you to significantly reduce the number of machines that you're renting from the cloud. And if you have never really used the cloud on any scale, the cloud is much more expensive than you think because it needs to run for 24 hours and the price accumulates very, very quickly. So. If instead of using several hundred machines, you can actually cut this number of machines by a factor of 10, uh, you're actually saving real money. And, and this is why these systems are interesting. It's not just the, the, the performance. Okay. okay, now very quickly. Um, may I uh, ask very quickly here? Uh, yeah. uh, do it also electricity uh, costs, are, are they also considered here? Or, I mean, obviously what? they're not uh, electricity costs. 
Well, so the electricity cost are, are considered as part of the cost of the data center and in the cloud, you just pay for renting the cloud. The electricity yeah, cost yeah. is something mm -hmm. that the provider has in there, right? So so the I know that uh, people who sell FPGAs, they like to claim that FPGAs are very energy efficient. Uh, uh, I'm sorry for the silence folks here. Uh, look at the specifications of power consumption of some of these new boards, right? Uh, and I think any claim of energy efficiency, right? I mean, uh, uh, you know, needs to be to put into consideration. Of course, you save energy if you at the end use less machines, then you're saving energy, right? But you're saving energy because you need less machines to run something. It's not necessarily because the FPGA is a lower energy processor compared to a CPU, right? So, so the, the, the cost of energy is embedded in the total cost of an ownership in these systems. Okay. Thank you. Sure. All right. I also have a very good question. Yes, go ahead. So if you, if you go back two slides, uh, can you please um, briefly explain what's the, on the bottom right, there's a, uh, in, the, in the figure, it says two engine compute and two engines over. What's the difference between these two? So uh, this is something that we, Put on the on the paper because we wanted to really emphasize, uh, and I'll come back to it uh, on on the next use case, right? I mean, uh, 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 so a lot of people, especially when they do research, right, they just give you the throughput of what the FPGA can actually reach, what they actually can do, right? Uh, in real systems, uh, and when we come, if you want to, from the database world, distributed systems and so forth, right? I mean, uh, when you talk about throughput, you talk about the end-to-end -end throughput, right? I mean, uh, you you need to you need to put your query in, you need to provide your data, you need to get the results out and all those things interfere. So what you see in there is the difference between uh, the throughput that we can get on the FPGA if, if we just treat the FPGA as a completely ideal system where there is no cost in sending your, quest, your query and then getting your results and things like this. And what happens in reality uh, because you need to actually send your routes to the FPGA, the FPGA needs to compute the results, and then you need to get the results out. And as you can see, it's a significant performance drop, right? Because uh, all these things are going, in the case of uh, Amazon F1, they are going through the same PCI interface, and, and this actually interferes with each other, right? So the overall is the real performance that you're going to get in a system, right? Okay? Okay, thanks. All right, so let me sort of now uh, here very, very quickly uh, talk about the minimum connection time. The minimum connection time is yet another system that is part of this engine. And just to be very honest in academia, so we were very successful with this one. So Amadeo said, okay, we are very, very happy with these results. Here is another module where we think that you can do exactly the same. So go and get the minimum connection time and speed it up using an FPGA. So what is the minimum connection time? The minimum connection time is a subcomponent, unlike the route scoring, is a, is a particular software component of the domain explorer. Okay? And what the domain connection, what the, sorry, what the minimum connection time does, it's, uh, it actually checks uh, whenever you have a flight where you need to sort of stop somewhere, right? You're going from, let's say, Zurich to New York, and you're going through London. Whenever you go into London, you need to check whether in fact you have enough time to make a connection. I cannot give you combinations of flights that uh, one flight arrives and the other one leaves five minutes later because you don't have the time to make the connection. You cannot, you don't have the time to get out of the plane, go to the other terminal and get on the other plane, right? So it doesn't work. So the minimum connection time is a module that what it does is that uh, you give them a combination of flights and depending on the airports, depending on the airlines, depending on the type of the, of the day and, and so forth, right? It's a relatively complex decision process, tells you whether the connect, what, what is the connection time that you're going to need for that combination of flights, right? So this is a module that runs in there. Uh, what happens in practice is that it actually takes close to 40% of the computing capacity of the domain explorer is this minimum connection time uh, module. So it's a module that if you can accelerate in, some, in whatever way, or you can make it better, you're going to make a significant impact on the domain explorer, okay? So uh, I'm not going to, uh, to get into, uh, into a huge discussion of how this was implemented again, because we have a paper, you can go and look it up, right? I mean, uh, and I'm happy to discuss it. And in fact, uh, the person who did this is attending the winter school is Fabio Maschi. 
uh, who is here, so you can actually go and grill him for all the details, right? I mean, uh, once I'm done uh, with the presentation. Okay. Um, let me just sort of give you an idea of, of what the, 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 the minimum connection time does. This is actually, if you want to look at it, it's a collection of rules, uh, like the ones that you see on the slide that says in the Zurich airport, uh, if your inbound terminal is international and your outbound terminal is any of them and you don't know anything else, then the minimum transfer time is 90 minutes, right? Uh, so in the Zurich airport, that will be rule number one, uh, regardless of what terminal you arrive, if your flight is from Schengen and your flight is going out to Schengen, uh, then the, the transfer time is 25 minutes, right? And what the minimum connection time module does, it has rules for all the airports in the, of the world, for all the airlines, different times of day, for summer, for winter, many different combinations. And then what you need to do is whenever you get a combination of routes, uh, or you get the questions, right? I mean, uh, for these combinations, you need to actually go and compute what is the minimum connection time, right? So I'm going from here, I'm going there. How much time do I need to connect these two flights uh, in, uh, in Zurich, okay? Uh, so um, I'm going to skip this uh, in the interest of time, how this is implemented. We implemented it using a non-finite uh, state automata, which works very well on an FPGA. Uh, and uh, we exploit the parallelism on the FPGA uh, to run you know, the search over the, over the finite state automata in parallel, right? Um, <clears throat> so let me just sort of get directly into the performance results. And uh, what you see here uh, is um, is in the uh, on this side. You see that uh, this is rules. This is the system that Amadeus now uses. It's a Java-based rule based rule system. This is a, an implementation that we did on the CPU just to make sure that we were comparing to something that it was a bit better than than rules because rules is not the most efficient system out there. And this is what we did on the FPGA. And this is with one engine, with two engines, with four engines, and eight engines, right? And, uh, and again, you can go and look it up in the paper, write all the details of what this means. And like in the case before, you see, we can actually, if we can actually put eight of these engines on the FPGA, we get close to uh, 50 million queries, right? I mean, uh, uh, per second, right? I mean, uh, uh, on an FPGA, which again is significantly faster, but this is orders of magnitude faster than uh, what they do today, right? However, uh, and I want to show this example just to show that this has a catch, right? Uh, you see that the performance at the beginning is not very high. Why? Because uh, this is the batch size. So that means how many requests we are giving to the FPGA. And the FPGA can exploit parallelism if it has, if it has many requests, because we are exploiting to a certain extent not only the special parallelism, we are also exploiting the pipeline parallelism. So if the batch size of requests that you're giving it is too small, the FPGA, and then you see here on the right figure, right? The FPGA is not uh, the queries per dollar, right? Whenever you compare to uh, a deployment on, 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 uh, on the cloud, uh, the FPGA is not better uh, than a CPU, right? It is only when you have batch sizes that are big enough that the FPGA starts paying off, okay? So the CPU also works with batches. Uh, that, so it is not that something that is unique to the FPGA. What is unique is that the batches that the FPGA needs to actually be ahead tends to be much larger than the batches that the CPU uses. Okay? So, but at any rate, the, just a summary of this is uh, we had another design or an FPGA that is significantly better than what you can do with a CPU. So we can actually go and, and, and claim victory, right? Now, I want to show this example because in, in practice, this is not what happened. And, and I know this because I'm not speculating. Now Amadeus has gone and has tried to uh, actually deploy this and that, done a lot of calculations, right? Uh, and the previous calculation that we had of saying now that we can actually replace so many machines with a machine with an FPGA and use many less, uh, far less machines no longer works. And it no longer works because um, the MCT is, is a software module of a larger system, right? Uh, so you still need machines to run the rest of the system. So imagine that you had a, a total of, of X machines to run your system and then given the workload, so you need X minus M for the standard load that has nothing to do with the MCT. And then you need M machines for the MCT, okay? And uh, typically the, 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 the machines that you need for the rest of the load are, is bigger than the machines that you need for MCT. 
And what we're doing now is we are saying, instead of running a normal computer, put an FPGA on those computers and then run the MCT on the FPGA, okay? Uh, but that means that you still need to have the X minus N machines in order to run the rest of the load, right? Now, depending on how big this X minus N is, compared to the additional price of using an FPGA on those machines, this might actually not work. And to our surprise, in the particular constellation of what Amazon, does, what Amadeus does, uh, this combination does not quite work, neither on the data center, so if you're talking about the price of machines and how many machines you need and so forth, but also it doesn't work on the cloud either. Actually, the cloud deployment becomes significantly more expensive. Why? Because a machine with an FPGA costs much, much more, uh, it's about four or five times more than a machine that does not have an FPGA. So in spite of the fact that you need less machines, your machines are now more expensive. And because they are four or five times more expensive, but the factor, the reduction factor that you have for the number of machines is not four or five, the deployment becomes more expensive. So you do have something that runs on an FPGA that is significantly faster, that runs a very cool algorithm. The design is, 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 is really, really interesting. But when you actually deploy it on a real system, it actually doesn't pay off. And this is something that people need to keep in mind whenever they are talking about using uh, FPGAs on data centers. Now, why this is the case? Well, there are a number of factors that uh, I'm not going to have to go into, into them. But if you are doing research in this area, I would really encourage you to look at these factors because actually you will be able to do much better research, but you will also find very interesting research questions that come up by looking at these factors, right? Uh, in the particular case, for instance, something that uh, we found very interesting is that the Amazon F1 instances have a, a relatively weak CPU uh, compared to a powerful FPGA. So that means that on the Amazon F1 instances, for the particular workload that we have, the CPU is not strong enough to put enough load on the FPGA. So which means that although on the FPGA, we could potentially, as I told you a second ago, right, we could do 50 million requests per second, we cannot because the CPU cannot send you 50 million requests per second. So in essence, uh, we can only put so much load on the FPGA and then the FPGA can only do as much as you give it to work and it's not enough. And this has a problem in this particular case because that means that in order to cope with the total load, because you are not putting enough load on the FPGAs, you need more machines, you need more FPGAs uh, because the bottleneck is on the CPU. And that actually pushes the price of your system up which again makes it, in this particular case, makes it something that is not economic, right? Uh, so these, these are all issues that whenever you talk about FPGAs in data centers uh, become very, very important. It goes beyond, thanks for the question before about uh, power consumption and things like this, but you need to look at the whole system. And I really would like to encourage you to look at the whole system, not because it just makes the problem more complicated, but also makes the problem more interesting and more real. And you will find a lot of very interesting research questions by looking at how to embed an FPGA end-to-end -end into real systems. Okay. So I'm a little bit over time. Let me just sort of uh, have a couple more slides and I will finish and then we can actually discuss a bit more if you want to. Uh, so how to make it better? Uh, and, and now I'm going to go back to some of the things that we are doing on the Silence cluster that Silence has, has uh, made available to, uh, to everybody and that is running at ETH, right? Uh, so in data centers, like in the cloud, actually the network is the key. Uh, it is very difficult to balance the power of the CPU and the power of the FPGA in the right way, especially if you're in the cloud because you have virtual machines and so forth, right? And if the system is not balanced, then you have cost issues. And this is what happened in the case of Amadeus. So we have something that runs much, much faster on the FPGA in the particular configuration that uh, Amazon makes available, uh, this doesn't work, okay? Um, so connecting the FPGA to the network, and this is why at the beginning of the talk, I was speaking about the Microsoft Catapult example where they ended up not connecting the FPGAs to each other through a serial connection, but actually putting them directly on the network or the uh, Amazon example with uh, Amazon Aqua, where you have the system connected on the network, putting the FPGA directly on the network makes the FPGA not just a coprocessor, co it makes it a first class citizen. And it actually makes it something that is available uh, for 
much different configurations uh, that are from the ones that are available if it is only on the PCI. So for instance, in the case of uh, the use cases that I have just presented, if the FPGA is on the network, then we can actually treat the FPGA as a service provider where we send the request and we get them back. And then we need to worry much less about how are we going to actually use these resources? Because potentially we can even use not only one FPGA, but we can actually use several FPGAs on different machines if they are idle, even if we are not using the CPU. So uh, putting the FPGA on the network, it turns it into a first class citizen, <clears throat> allows you different configurations. And this is why now you're seeing things like a smart NICs, a smart storage, a smart disaggregated memory, uh, and all those sort of things. And at the end of the day, if you think about data centers and the cloud, right? I mean, uh, the, the way people get computing power is through distribution. They don't use one machine, they use 100 machines. Uh, they don't use one GPU, they use clusters of GPUs within one machine, but also across different machines, right? FPGAs are not gonna be different. In order to tackle the problems that we have today, you're gonna have to find a way to actually put 100 FPGAs together. You need to have a cluster of FPGAs. And this is only possible uh, in an efficient way if you have access to the network. Now you can do like a GPU and then just assume that you have CPUs in front, but FPGAs are especially good if you put them on, a, on, the, on the network because they can actually process the network data straight as it comes from the network. They can actually do a streaming and all those sort of things. And that will be a significant advantage over what GPUs can do, okay? And so a lot of these discussions that come of FPGAs versus GPUs, right? Uh, in the case of the cloud or, or, or data centers, right? I think they're really not relevant because the big advantage of FPGAs is that they can actually be used in ways that you will never use a GPU in that particular way. Right? And the examples that I have given you from, uh, from Microsoft and, 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 and Amazon, right? I think they prove this. So let me just, in the interest of time, let me just uh, conclude here. Um, of course, we are not yet there. Uh, boards uh, need to evolve and might evolve, right? I mean, uh, so as we said earlier, uh, eventually, you might have hardened network protocols, right? Instead of having a network protocol, a TCP IP stack, like the ones that we have developed as part of um, developing HLS or on an RTL or whatever it is that you develop, uh, some part of the protocol might be hardened and that will actually be very good because then you don't actually don't have, you don't have to implement it. It doesn't take that much space on the FPGA. Uh, the network stacks need to be available. Uh, so whenever you buy a computer, you don't have to worry about you know, having to put the network stack, right? I mean, uh, things can actually do wireless and could do networking, right? A little bit uh, off the shelf whenever you buy them. FPGAs, unfortunately, are not yet there. And in the case of data centers, this needs to happen, right? Uh, uh, if you're going to use them in this, in, this, uh, uh, in this way. And it's not only just that they need to have these stacks, uh, the, the shells uh, and the tools must support networking in a transparent way. Uh, there has to be language integration, right? I mean, uh, you need to be able to use the, the, the network from the different languages, HLS, OpenCL, whatever it is that you want to use in a reasonable manner and with reasonable interfaces and so forth, right? Uh, so, so we are not yet there, uh, but if you're a researcher, these are all great opportunities. Uh, there are many opportunities for, for working on these problems, developing your own stack, developing interfaces to these stacks, uh, and making important contributions by building applications that actually build on FPGAs, collections of FPGAs to tackle these real problems that you see in data centers, like the ones that we have uh, that I have presented. 